go ahead and get started. Um, sorry if I seem a little distracted. I'm also letting people in the room, but um, like I mentioned, uh, my name is Blair Murphy and I'm currently the acting executive director at Arlington Arts Center. Um, until a couple weeks ago, I was the curator of exhibitions. So um, curating our exhibitions and working with all of the artists that we show. I'm really happy to be here this evening, with three of our uh, Solos 2020 artists. Um, Solos 2020 is the current exhibition in our main gallery spaces. So it was very exciting. At the end of September, we did reopen to the public and especially really appreciate all the artists whose work we're showing right now and all the work they've done to make these shows happen under some pretty, um, in, you know, unexpected for everyone's circumstances. Um, if you haven't had a chance to come see the exhibitions, like I mentioned, we, we do have public gallery hours right now. We're open Wednesday through Saturday from 12 to 5. Um, you don't need to make a reservation if you haven't been to Arlington Arts Center. Um, we do have a pretty large space, and so we felt like, you know, most of the time if you come, there's really only one or two other people there. There's a lot of room to spread out. We are requiring masks inside and social distancing. There's lots of hand sanitizer. So we hope you can come and um, see the shows while we're open. Um, and also enjoy the talk tonight. Um, so Solos is one of Arlington Arts Center's longest running programs. Um, if you're not familiar with AAC, we have an exhibition program, an education program, and an artist residency program. And Solos is um, really one of the cornerstones of our exhibition program. We do a call once a year for artists to propose solo style shows in one of our seven main gallery spaces, and we always have a couple outside jurors who um, select the artists through that call. Um, but this year, the two uh, jurors um, were Terrence Washington, who was uh, previously um, at the National Gallery of Art and is now at Next Haven, a new residency and art space in New Haven, Connecticut. And then Michael Benevento, who is the director of Current Gallery, which is an artist-run space in Baltimore. So we really appreciate all of the work that the two of them did and all the thoughtfulness they put into selecting the artists um, uh, for solos this year. We are doing, this is the first of two talks. So the next talk um, this evening, we'll be talking with Anne Claire Rogers and Kim Urena and Tara Gupta, and then in Two weeks on November 12th, also on Thursday, 6 p.m., we'll be talking with Rebecca Rivas Rogers, Constance Simon, and Heidi Benizek um, about their solos exhibitions. And we are going to move on to our last artist, um, Tara Gupta. Tara is a multimedia artist and an Indian American queer cis woman born and raised in Fairfax County, Virginia. She holds a BFA from Rhode Island School of Design, um, where she created the reality TV show, 100 Days to Zero Waste, and founded Earth House, a redeveloped home that supports the physical and social adaptations necessary for a more sustainable lifestyle. So Tara has a wide range of experience, more recently has come back to focusing uh, more on her painting work. So uh, that's what's in the show at AAC, just painting and a little bit of sculpture. So uh, Tara, do you want to do your screen share? Yeah, of course. Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm just going to talk about uh, some of the pieces that are up and, and just kind of explain where they came from. Uh, there's, there's quite a few pieces up if you've, if you've gotten the chance to go take a look at the show. So I'm, I'm really only going to talk about a few, but um, they generally have a, a similar playful character to them. So some of the same themes uh, apply. So I based a lot of the, the symbology in my paintings uh, off of these different symbols that you see here. It's, uh, all of them are really, really vibrant in color. Um, they're very, very much sort of immediate emotional expressions. I, I have an animation background. So a lot of it also comes out in a sort of animated narrative that is told uh, within the scope of, of sort of like a one frame political cartoon, uh, a one frame emotional cartoon, I would say. So, um, so we'll, we'll kind of come back to a lot of these different, uh, a lot of these different themes, but that's really what makes up what I call uh, to be Mindscape, which is the title of, of this exhibition. 
really using the the symbology uh, that that you see in your mind as well um, as like your third eye, uh, really when when interpreting different emotional experiences. So this is big face. This actually this piece is is quite um, important to the collection because it it actually was the first of all the the MyScape series, and um, big face actually, I I really relate a lot to to the actual the big face character here um i think that this this character actually it it really speaks about a lot of different um power structures that go on so um this was kind of at the beginning of a period of illness for me um and and a lot of the pieces hereafter really really speak about that illness that sort of a little bit of what Anne was saying too, just that, that experience of dealing with that, uh, like a chronic illness or, or the emotional processing of that and how that comes out in, in artwork. And so a lot of Mindscape has to do with how, how the emotional landscape of illness can also parallel the emotional uh, or, or, or the happenings uh, of earth itself and the, the way that it is going through fever with um, the different events that are, are just hitting us in extreme ways um on on the actual landscape of order so so here we have power structures where where you see the uh the the characters below um really are are just your your personal demons and you have your your personal uh angels as well but big face is uh big face has is a mix of emotions uh herself she's she's uh powerful but she's also angry in certain ways or or uh, can can be a villain herself. She's not not really a hero in this sense, and uh, she she has some sort of claws which are are kind of gripping the 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 landscape beneath her. So this was just really it came out of my own life. It came out of this uh, these hierarchies and these these structures that I was seeing in in terms of um, a project I was doing in co housing and and so I just wanted to kind of give a little explanation behind it and draw your attention to different ways that power structures can show up within a community as well, and how that really plays into this type of work. So this is Fire Up, Water Down. This is another uh, piece that I, I made quite early on. And this was actually um, in relation to both a kidney biopsy as well as uh, the idea in Tai Chi of, uh, of how you create balance within a body. So, this person here is is the main character this this character that uh his his head is on fire um i would say that he is uh he, he's experiencing this tai chi imbalance uh which is like usually you're supposed to have water up and fire down and the idea is this yin yang that that really cools you down and uh keeps your head very sound and and peaceful and the fire uh really keeps you going and keeps you energized and passionate but in this in this situation, um, you can't see so clearly, but he has his back is very, uh, very outlined and, and really um, done in, in sort of subtractive lines where I've scratched into the canvas, into the paint while it's still drying. And so there, there is that um, sort of like interaction with the canvas that I have in that, in that process of making it, um, especially with some of the textures where all of these are scratches also. Uh, around him and the environment around him in that blue yellow sky and so a lot of that just uh is meant to describe uh pain but there is still like a very playful nature to the whole piece as a whole so um while it's a complex piece in terms of the emotions that are going on it's um it's it's comes from a very positive uh outlook on, on the, the overall situation and hence why why the color also is is meant to uplift and keep it uh keep it in sort of a dr seuss type vibe so uh omar shalong face uh is sort of maybe just uh, the third piece in the series that i made after these two um and again is a very important piece to me um in that it really it really was the next stage of exploration in this um it really was the the stage where I started experimenting with shadows as different alternative selves or different um, ways of perceiving uh, the flip side of the nature of a person. So, so the shadow, it, 
actually takes on a whole character in itself here. So, so you have this, uh, again, with the idea of Tai Chi, you have this man right here in the far right corner, uh, far upper right corner, who is, is actually holding a ball of chi. And so he's directing the lightning, whereas in Big Face, uh, we just had the lightning sort of um, a, as a character in, in the environment, but here the lightning has now become um, an energy force to be used. Um, and so we'll see that later also as, as lightning becomes spiritual energy of a sort um, and electrifying energy in, in enlightenment. Um, and so the trees too, I try to give the trees a, a little bit more personality because they actually are, are, are I see them as characters. Uh, and so sometimes they have interchangeable uh, features with the, with the humans and they become very much characters in, in this whole story that is being told. Um, I don't know if anyone is a Murakami fan, but uh, Longface, this, this actually, this Longface uh, character that's in this book, Killing Commendator, was uh, definitely an inspiration to me in this piece. And so I, he, he's basically this character that comes out of this trap door and really makes the whole, the whole question of reality kind of upend itself. Um, his presence in, in this book, it really, it sh it's, he, he basically comes out of a painting, comes into life and disrupts, disrupts the reality of the book so that you don't really know what, what is real, what isn't, but you know that it's not what's normal. And that's kind of the idea that I was referencing in this particular piece. Um, so the idea with Longface, who is this, this character right in that lower left corner, is, um, is that he shakes up this whole idea of just kind of his trapdoor of reality. And, and then he also brings us into this as another reality wormhole, uh, this, this little waterfall. You don't really know if it's, if it's a waterfall, if it's going, or if he's spitting it out. Uh, and so the directionality of that also is something in question. So this is Dance of the Night Tree. Dance of the Night Tree is, um, it's, it's again about uh, personifying the tree, about thinking about uh, the relationship between trees and humans and thinking about the, the neural networks also that happen in trees. Uh, what, what are the li lives of trees? Um, and, uh, and also referencing the whole. Um, I have a lot of holes in my work, uh, but they're, they're not often in, in people as much as uh, sometimes they, they're in the character themselves. But uh, often when the character is a little bit less human-like um, and the whole is not really necessarily, the whole actually represents more unity or, or more like uh, you, you have some of whatever is around you in you rather than uh, missing something. And so he's, he's perfectly peaceful um, and, and going on his, his secretive dance journey. Um, but he, he's actually uh, one with his environment through the whole rather than missing something. Oh, and this is also a reference to um, Annihilation. I was just bringing that idea in. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen that movie, but Annihilation also, again, it references this sort of thinking about the relationship between trees and humans, especially in relationship to a, a very uh, extreme disease. So in this case, in Annihilation's case, it was cancer. Playmates. So um, after kind of exploring some of these more um, illness-related, energy-related uh, topics, then I, I wanted to just kind of think about just just something quite quite light and actually play with these shadows again, but but really just go back to something like even more playful than uh, than than any of the topics I was thinking about before. And so I made this piece um, really just embodying the Lorax, um, especially with these trees. Um, thinking about just like how, how these characters can be even more playful with each other. Again, some of them are what you might consider monsters if you, if you saw them in, in a children's book, but, uh, but again, the context would be a children's book. It wouldn't really be um, anything too, too scary. So um, this, was, this was along the same colors. Uh, Willing Blindness was, was made with the same, um, the same colors as Playmates, but it was actually, again, referencing a little bit of a darker theme as well, or, or just kind of the fact that uh, really honing into this idea of the shadow, which I brought up earlier, and, and how the shadow um, in particular, the shadow in the case of this so-called monster is not really a 
monster. The shadow is really just a figure that is um, serene and, and really not at all harmful, uh, not at all unfriendly, but we, we focus on the monster and we, we think of this as reality. So what are we thinking of it as reality? Again, there's a reference to a hole, though not an actual hole, um, but there's sort of like a, a seed of potential here in, in this person who, who is choosing uh, in, his, in his willing blindness only to see the monster. So the lightning tree, um, the lightning tree is, uh, I referenced before the, the use of lightning as a way of channeling energy for, uh, for spiritual purposes. And so here, the tree is actually going through enlightenment, uh, while these two people kind of just sit by the side and, and observe, um, though they don't really know what's going on. So they're, they're sort of just hanging out, having a picnic. Um, this, this guy's just looking on this one's just hanging out and his drink is falling out of his hand but um but this tree which is very personified it, it even has hands for branches it it's really having this whole otherworldly experience on its own and so really shifting the focus of of who are we focusing on um what what is uh each organism capable of and uh and thinking of of where that energy is coming from too in, in the sense of lightning The climber. Uh, so, so the climber was uh, was really just. I, I started to work very big, um, and and so this was just more of an immediate piece. The climber actually, I, I ended up working very much in a sort of finger painting way, or or getting really into the the textural nature of the canvas. Um, and so I ended up making Big Man, which was completely finger painted, and uh, and it was just another reference to uh, the climber, except it was, it was much more peaceful. So while the climber was um, about an ambitious man uh, who, who's really in the world, big man was actually, okay, who does the climber become after he's achieved whatever he needs to achieve? And he's, he's ready to like sort of look back down in the world and, and uh, detach from the world. And so big man is really um, a big man because he's achieved this sort of uh, detachment and this sort of acceptance of life. So he's, he's holding one hand up, which he's, he's actually holding it up in blessing. Um, and so he, he is a, like a very, a big man, not though he is big, big in, in the physical sense, he, he's a big man more in his, in his spiritual sense. So, um, I, I, I use, utilize different techniques in, in sort of like pulling out the idea, ideas behind this, but this one, I actually ended up um, just along that playful vein, I ended up um, just using some prompts and I, I ended up with these lightsaber or like uh, characters that, that ended up as two heads. And so two heads um, is, is actually one of my favorite pieces now, but uh, two heads again, use, utilizes the whole uh, and, and it has this character that's going through this conflict. So um, it, in the person, in the character itself, it, it's really referencing that sort of uh, that dichotomy between um, between the character in just its two sides, um, rather than just um, the character and its shadow. And so it's just another way of sort of playing with the same theme, looking at um, the eyes of this character with the the lightsaber eyes, as uh, as another form of, of energy. What kind of energy is this character emitting? Um, and here we have another shadow in the corner that is, is quite different to the character itself. Yeah, so I, at, around the same time, I also did some um, interesting meditations, which uh, help you visualize different materials uh, or different, different experiences. And I, uh, I saw this zebra and, and a blue baton. And so um, the zebra actually was another another image of conflict, I would say, or, or of this inner conflict. And so um, this was another way of getting at those, uh, those sort of projected mental images. And so um, the zebra, it, it split in the vision and then it, um, out of it comes a, comes a blue baton. Um, I don't really have any explanation for you beyond that, but it's a, it's a blue zebra and it's, um, it, you can see the line actually where it has split in the middle. Um, the baton is supposed to be a, a healing element. So 
So when it splits, uh, it sort of kind of gives you this secretive baton, which then you can grab. And so it's uh, it's almost it's a little bit of an adventure that you you can play with just uh, with the with the piece itself. And the zebra is very very much a mystical creature um, in this situation where it it also has the feet. It has it has uh, its own story going on. So, so yeah, at the same time, uh, visualizing that, I, I ended up visualizing sort of these, um, very much this, uh, this dichotomy of this sort of like angel demon dichotomy, um, I would say in that same meditation. And so I, I ended up making Gargoyle in the Sun, which was, uh, again, about that conflict about, about that, um, what is the difference between a uh between a gargoyle who who is supposed to be like this protector but also can be seen as this evil evil sort of creature uh and and this gargoyle who's just playing in this in this light element which is sun um and and that also made me think of just my own uh cultural heritage of 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 gurus as well and thinking about hinduism and, and how people seek out gurus and and so this piece is really about that um where each person in this is reaching for what their their perceived higher self is, and so that it would that would be the the little gold man is reaching for this this bigger red man who's reaching for this uh, this orange man who's reaching for this yellow man, but uh, we don't really know what this yellow man is reaching for or if he's reaching at all, and so it's sort of just meant to allow you to to question that uh, and reflect on that. So that's all the pieces I have for, for this section, but thanks for joining me for this. Yeah, thanks, Cara. That was, that was great. Um, uh, we've gotten lots of comments, but no for questions. Yeah, if you, you guys do have questions, you can um, put them in the chat. Um, Someone would, did bring up the kind of tension in the work, or not maybe not tension actually, but this that it sort of makes something playful out of um, a place of, I mean, it's potentially a place of suffering. You've talked some about your own sort of, um, sort of it kind of coming from um, some of the health issues you've gone through. And then also this idea of like the sort of the earth as a, as a metaphorical body in a way. Um, and that tension was something I was interested in, like that um, there's sort of a dark side to some of the work, but also some humor and like I said, playfulness. Is that something you're, I guess, sort of consciously trying to cultivate? Yeah, I think that that definitely, that definitely just comes out probably just from my perspective on life. But this series is definitely uh, like unusual, like once when I started making this series, it was totally different than uh, my previous work. And so it really just I, I feel like it came out of actually this particular flair I had of of, uh, of lupus. And so it was just kind of like when I, when I entered the flare, I started making pieces. And then I don't know, it just it just kept coming out until I kind of healed. Um, and I think that part of it was just like, uh, it, it was just a, a sort of a necessary tool for that. Um, and, and I couldn't make them too dark either because they, they were also helping me heal. So I think that that's part of it is whenever you're going through that experience, you, you just need, uh, you need both sides of the, of the coin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, I mean, the pieces, like you mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot of work in the show and it, when you were installing, we talked some about how that choice to really Sort of fill the walls and fill the gallery i think made visual sense with the feeling of the pieces so it kind of has a logic that like the pieces are very active and very kind of bold and vibrant and then having the gallery filled makes sense on that level um but is it also kind of important for you on a more conceptual level that the viewer can experience so many of them at once or sort of can enter this world in a way is that like is, yeah, they, yeah, they, that's the way they kind of function together. An awesome question because it, it was very important, and uh, I think I remember we had that conversation. And I, I was just like, I, I saw the space; it was it was so big, and I was like, we have to fill this up. Um, and uh, and I think part of that is just the fact that it, it's that feeling of being overwhelmed, and and I think that the pieces themselves, uh, like someone mentioned in the chat, it, they they're jarring, and that's true. Um, they 
like the colors, the, the bold figures, everything is sort of meant to pop. And it's almost a lot to have in your space, especially. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, uh, we live with them. So I live with them. So it's kind of um, like, I don't, I, I don't even look at them all the time. But I, I know that there are a lot um, to have in your space. It's just that um, I feel like that is that is the message of the piece. Yeah, we're, um, I've mentioned, I think a couple people know this, and we've talked about it, but AAC is a polling place, and the gallery where Tara's work is, is where people will be voting next Tuesday. So hopefully people feel good about that and enjoy it. <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully we did they read into the inner conflict that's in them. <laughs> yeah. um, we did have a couple questions. Uh, Lisa was interested in this, the final piece you, you showed, and this idea of endless reaching for a higher self, um, or is it about reaching for a higher power beyond oneself, like a like a deity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, reaching for their higher selves, it definitely is. Um, that last one, I would say, the top the top guy is reaching for that that higher self that has no form. Um, but each of them are sort of grabbing onto a form until then, and so I would say that. That's the whole idea of that guruhood too, in in um, in they're really looking like okay for something that they can relate to, um, and so it, it's not it's also sort of um, cynical of that in a way um, because I I really believe that you, you look for your higher self within you, you use external situations to look for your higher self within you, but um, but this is really these these characters are looking outside of themselves, and so it's kind of questioning okay is that does it make sense is it is it is this cycle making sense um in that piece a couple people were also curious about to hear more about the two heads uh could you talk a little bit about the intention is it a sort of question of tearing oneself apart or conflicting identities or uh america personified place where a lot of us are yeah so so two heads i would say um the the sort of idea of that conflict comes up again and again it's not um it's 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 not really per america per se or um it's more um it's more just uh us as human beings i would say um all going through uh this dichotomy that comes up in different ways and so that's the two heads that's also in um the zebra piece that's also in another piece called Mindscape, which is uh, or, uh, called Mind Room, which has these two figures, um, which someone's looking in on on their mind, basically, and it has one figure going through a piece of being one figure going through crisis of self. So I think that that's a theme I use in my work just to sort of talk about anyone going through stress. Um, there's, there's really beautiful lessons that come through stress. And, and so I think part of that is just saying, could you even get to this this piece of being um, without going through stress in that way? Um, and so par a, a, lo a lot of that is just to to sort of personify that that feeling. Okay, we've got one more question, um, and this is from Kim. Um, she was curious about the Tiffany Gallery and having your work in that space and how that um, impacted if that impacted how you thought about the exhibition. In the interaction of the colors, and there's actually there is a there's a sculpture piece in this show that is a window, and I think that's a work you had already, you already made. You didn't, I think we talked about it, and you said you hadn't made it in response. But do you want to talk a little bit about how you how the gallery sort of factored in to your decisions, or if it did? Yeah, you know, once I saw once I saw the space, I definitely was thinking, okay, it. I guess it looked like it was already maximalist to me because of the windows. Uh, so I, I think when I when I looked at the other walls, I was thinking, you know, there's no way I'm not going to go maximalist on the other walls. Uh, and so that's why I, I also tried to cra crowd my pieces a little bit. Um, before, I think I was thinking, OK, I'll just put some of the big ones, like one, two, three, four, you know, just kind of evenly spaced out. But that definitely impacted my decision in thinking, OK, how can I really make this an unusual way of sort of collaging them in and mm -hmm. and respond to the windows mm -hmm. uh in force okay one last final question uh 
how much of your work is inspired by Hindu iconography? Um, I think they're asking, saying some of the figures re resemble some imagery they've seen of demons and other characters. Yeah, so I don't think I've um, very consciously done that, but honestly, um, the faces that I use or the face of this character that I've used again and again in the series is like very Indian looking. Uh, like the nose, I think, looks very Indian. The eyes look very Indian and, and they look like they have casual. They look like they have uh, this uh, eyeliner on. And so they really just look like like very Indian. And and so I think that that also has helped me. And, and my spirituality also comes from, it's informed by a lot of different Hindu ideas. And so I, I definitely reference that a lot, just not very directly, but much more subtly throughout the whole series. Well, thank you, Tara. Thanks thank you. Um, thanks for, to everybody for being here and um, listening to all the artists and offering great questions and comments in the chat. Like I mentioned at the beginning, um, so all of the shows are up in person. You can come to the gallery and you can see them physically in the space. Um, our hours are Wednesday through Saturday, noon to five. Um, you don't have to make a reservation if you haven't been to AAC before. We're in a pretty large building. So if you come on, especially on a weekday, but even on a Saturday, we have plenty of space. We are requiring masks in the building and distancing and all of that. Um, and we've, we've, done, we've put a lot of thought into you know, making sure that um, people will feel comfortable and safe in the space. So really encourage you to come see the shows while they're up. They are up until December 19th. So you have a little bit more time. We are closed the week of Thanksgiving, but besides that, we'll be open 12 to five Wednesday through Saturday. And um, we will also, we did record the talks tonight. So we'll have these up on our YouTube channel in the future. And the next talks with the other three solos artists, which I mentioned before, which will be Rebecca Rivas Rogers, Constance Simon, and Heidi Zinizek. And those are taking place two weeks from tonight. So on November 12th, also at six o'clock, also on Zoom. So same process for registering and everything. And thank you again. And thanks to all the artists for being here and for talking with us. And like I mentioned before, for um, doing all the work to make these exhibitions happen in this very, extraordinary and uh, challenging time for everybody. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thanks everybody and have a good night. <laughs>